Dive into God's Word. Dig a little deeper. Discover the Bible's message for you today. Pathway to Paradise Ministries presents Deeper, your daily Bible study with Dr. Tim Rumsey and Pastor David Salazar. You are listening to Deeper, your daily Bible study. My name is Tim Rumsey, and thanks for joining us today. I wish we could be sitting across from each other uh, in a uh, across a table or in a living room somewhere, but uh, we're thankful for technology that makes uh, studying together, at least on some level, possible. We're going to continue our study of Daniel chapter 8 today. Our lesson is titled, The Rise of the Little Horn, uh, this big player in Bible prophecy, both in Daniel 7 and Daniel chapter 8. We're going to take another look at it today. Let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we continue um, opening your word and seeking for understanding, as we do each day, we pray that you will help us understand historically and prophetically what's going on. That's, that's important. But even more important is the fact that these things will make a practical difference in our lives today. And so we ask uh, for this miracle, for your power in our lives, uh, for those that we love as well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As in Daniel chapter 7, the little horn makes an appearance in Daniel chapter 8. While Daniel 7 contains numerous helpful identifying characteristics of this little horn, it is Daniel 8 that reveals how the little horn or the papal power ascended to political and religious uh, supremacy and what exactly made it so destructive. Additionally, the angel interpreter provides valuable insights into the character of the papal power. Now let's continue where we left off yesterday. We had read yesterday about the ram and the goat. We saw that the angel clearly identifies these two symbols as pointing to the uh, Medes and the Persians for the ram and Greece for the goat. Now the angel does not provide that clear of an explanation for the little horn power, which has... uh, led some people to identify the little horn power with uh, a rather uh, obscure king um, hundreds of years before Christ, or a couple hundred years before Christ. We're going to see today that that just does not fit the flow of prophecy. The little horn power uh, really has to correspond with the fourth beast and the little horn of Daniel chapter 7, um, speaking, of course, of the Roman Empire. But let's uh, begin by reading the Bible here beginning in verse number 9. And out of one of them came forth a little horn. I should back up. Daniel 8 ended uh, by talking about the four winds of heaven. And now here comes verse 9. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. So if you notice here in verse number 9, the little horn begins... Uh, growing much as any other earthly empire would. It's expanding its geographical territory, the uh, land and the people that it controls, and it's expanding toward the south and toward the east, toward the pleasant land. In verse 10, we read this, And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Uh, Verse 12 says this, A host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. So some very... uh, Important and interesting interesting points are made here about the little horn. While it begins by growing geographically as any other earthly empire would, it very quickly begins growing in a new direction, and that direction is upward toward heaven. We saw that in verse 10, it waxed great even to the host of heaven. So here we see in verse 10, as it is waxing great, or you know, growing in a vertical direction, this is referring now to the switch between pagan Rome and papal Rome and the religious aspect um, that is being taken on. Now, in truth, 
there was religion connected with the pagan Roman Empire. It was just pagan religion. Uh, what makes the little horn and papal Rome so significant to Bible prophecy is the fact that it was Christianity now, you know, Bible religion that was um, being wrapped around this power, so to speak. Um, or you could say it the opposite way. This, the power of Rome was wrapping itself around Christianity. Um, and this brings up another important point. And, and the point is this. Bible prophecy, uh, by and large, the main thrust of Bible prophecy is on the body of Christ. It's on the people of God. Uh, and that holds true throughout all of history. Um, you can go all the way back to these prophecies that we're looking at here, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece. Uh, were there not- was there nothing else happening in the world? You know, of course there was. Why don't we have any Bible prophecies explaining uh, the sequence of, um, you know, empires in China and in the Far East during these years? Because there were, there were thriving, there were ancient civilizations, there were, you know, big things happening in other parts of the world. In India, why don't we have anything mentioned uh, about civilization in India or maybe in the Americas? What about the Incas and the Aztecs? Um, and even the people that came before them, is, are they not important? Well, of course they're important. Why do we not find them in the Bible? Is It's because Bible prophecy always focuses on those to whom God has given his covenant, those to whom he wants to work through to save the world. That's why uh, in Genesis we have the story of Noah. God is working through Noah to save the world, and so Bible prophecy focuses on Noah. As we move into Exodus and then much of the Old Testament, Bible prophecy focuses on the nation of Israel because it was the nation of Israel that God wanted to use to save the world, to prepare the world for the first advent. And as we move now into uh, the, the later prophecies of, of Daniel, you know, pointing forward in time to the Christian era and the prophecies of Revelation, the same thing holds true. The prophecies focus on Christianity on the body of Christ. Um, That's important to remember because as many people interpret Bible prophecy today, there is a a tendency, there is a desire um, for many people to take prophecies, lift them out of the Bible, and say, ooh, that applies to Russia today, or that applies to China today, uh, or, or this or that. And we lose when we lose sight of the focus of prophecy, which is always on the body of Christ, whatever that body is representing at that time in world history. If we lose sight of that focus, then we uh, we lose a foundation, we lose a footing that can keep us rooted in correct interpretation uh, of of Bible prophecy. Now, all of that to say <laughs> that the little horn here in Daniel chapter eight. Um, is mentioned in prophecy because it is impacting the people of God. It is impacting uh, those to whom God has given his covenant. And, um, you know, another point that bears noting here is that Daniel 8 appears to skip over the pagan uh, Roman phase of the Roman Empire. It goes straight from Daniel chapter 8, verse 8, where we have the goat, which of course is Greece, it goes straight from the the goat or Greece to the little horn. Uh, And the reason for that, again, is that Daniel 8 now is, even though it's retracing, retreading the history of Daniels 2 and 7, it is beginning to focus on this message of restoration. And the pagan Roman Empire uh, never really impacted, I'm going to try to say this uh, in the right way, it never really impacted uh, Christianity or God's covenant people in this sense. It never changed or um, decimated uh, the truth in the same way that papal Rome did. And because Daniel chapter 8 is now a chapter that's beginning to focus on the aspect of restoration, it's going to focus on those parts of the prophetic framework that explain why restoration is needed or how it happens. And um, the, the papal phase of the Roman Empire 
had a lot more to do with the desecration of the heavenly sanctuary and Christ's ministry in heaven than the pagan Roman Empire ever did. So another reason that um, we jump straight to the little horn. Now, uh, we're reading again in verse number 9, Out of one of the winds came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south, toward the east, and toward the pleasant land. Notice that it is exceeding great. The ram was great, the goat was very great, the little horn is exceeding great. And as we mentioned yesterday, uh, one of the things that this means is that as time goes on, the human will has become harder and harder and um, less susceptible to the Holy Spirit working. We see that being reflected in the fact that the little horn is exceeding great, and it's not in a good way. It's exceeding hard, uh, exceedingly hardened to the Holy Spirit's work. Now, in verses 10 and 11 and 12, we see the results of this religious or spiritual aspect of the little horn power. In verse 11, he magnifies himself even to the prince of the host. That's a reference to Jesus Christ, our high priest in heaven. Uh, and the uh, by him, by the little horn, the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary, that is Christ's sanctuary, was cast down. And this certainly happened during the long years of the Middle Ages. Um, every aspect of truth that pointed uh, to Jesus Christ uh, was attacked. We'll look at those more closely tomorrow as we look at the attack on the sanctuary. Uh, the other thing that was attacked was the truth. In Daniel 12, it says that it cast down the truth to the ground. And um, the truth, of course, uh, pointing to the Bible, the Word of God, as the source of truth uh, for centuries. The Bible was kept away from the common people. If you were not privileged to be educated um, and to have learned a, a dead, unused language, <laughs> the Latin language at that point in time, uh, you basically had no access to the Bible. And so the truth was also cast down to the ground so that people could not access it. Uh, I'd like to read a quote for you from Great Controversy, page 572, and it's speaking to uh, the reasons why popery has held such an unbreakable sway over humanity for so long. A large class, even of those who look upon Romanism with no favor, apprehend little danger from her power and influence. Many urge that the intellectual and moral darkness prevailing during the Middle Ages favored the spread of her dogmas, superstitions, and oppression, and that the greater intelligence of modern times, the general diffusion of knowledge, and the increasing liberality in matters of religion forbid a revival of intolerance and tyranny. The very thought that such a state of things will exist in this enlightened age is ridiculed. It is true that great light, intellectual, moral, and religious, is shining upon this generation. In the open pages of God's holy word, light from heaven has been shed upon the world. But it should be remembered that the greater the light bestowed, the greater the darkness of those who pervert and reject it. Uh, interesting statement regarding the um, ability of Romanism to adapt itself uh, to the times. This is one reason why you will find the Roman church uh, thriving in every part of the world, in every possible culture, even integrating with uh, every other various religion that may be offered. It adapts to the, the, uh, the whims and the suits and the fancies of man rather than to the will of God. Well, friends, we want to follow the will of God, don't we? And so here's our challenge for today. Uh, make God first today. Make him first for yourself, for your family. Dedicate yourself to him and say, Lord, whatever you may ask, wherever you may lead, I am willing to follow. Just give me the strength and the ability to do that. And he will. We are out of time. Thank you for studying with us today, and I hope that you will join in again tomorrow. Deeper is a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. For more Bible study resources, including books, DVDs, and study guides, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. To support this ministry with your tax-deductible contribution, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. That's 855-447-8788.